So welcome everyone. Uh, great morning to all of you. And my name is MK Saravanan. I work as a senior enterprise network engineer, basically a support engineer at FI Network Singapore. So since I need a lot of time for this talk, I will skip my intro. So directly I will jump into the agenda. I assume that user already know what is TLS and what is TLS 1.2. If it is completely new to TLS, it's going to be a little difficult for you. So the main focus of this presentation is what is new in TLS version 1.3. Even though I can give you a very few outline of SSL TLS in just few slides in case if you are very new to what is SSL. So I, I won't have time to cover all the changes. I will just tell you the important changes in TLS 1.3 because this presentation typically takes at least three hours. I am compressing in just 45 minutes. So as you all know, in the networking, in the OSI model, there are seven layers starting from application layer, session layer, transport, network, data link, and physical layer. The SSL TLS comes directly in that session layer just below the application. So what is the purpose of the SSL? Just to secure the application data. The actual application data is sent through the network using the so-called transport layer, right? At transport, we have TCP and UDP, but TLS need TCP. It cannot work with UDP. There is a separate version of TLS for UDP application called DTLS, Datagram Transport Layer Security. In today's talk, we are not going to discuss anything about DTLS. We will purely focus on TLS 1.3, okay? So if you want to protect your application data, in this example, I have took a HTTPS as an example. It hand over the data to SSL layer. It will add all the necessary security mechanism to provide confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity, and then hand over it to TCP for distributing over the network, and it will take the standard path of TCP, IP, the data link, and the physical layer. So the name SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer and the name TLS stands for Transport Layer Security. Both mean the same thing. You might be wondering why it is called with two different names, right? I will explain it in a, in a short while. There's a history behind that. So going forward, you should not use SSL. You should only use the word TLS. So if you ask a very basic question, what is needed to protect your application data? Basically, we need these five different things called confidentiality, meaning no one on the network should be able to see what data you are transferring to the other party. For this, we will use encryption from the cryptography department. So you encrypt the stuff. Then authenticity. If I connect to Amazon and buy something, I need to make sure I'm really talking to Amazon.com and not some man in the middle server. Okay. So we need to verify the server authentic authentication. It can be achieved using a server authentication. In TLS, it is achieved using the public key infrastructure by, by the use of SSL certificate. Okay. Then integrity, we have to make sure nobody is tampering with our data. That is what integrity property provides. Then non-repudiation, meaning the ability to prove to a third party that someone sent something. Let's say if you give 500 rupees to your friend, later you go and ask, hey, I, last day I gave you 500 rupees, can you please give it back? Let's say your friend says, no, 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 I never got any money from you. But how do you prove to a judge, right? You should have a mechanism to prove that you dearly sent that message. This property is called non-repudiation. Unfortunately, TLS does not provide this property. You have to use some other application layer mechanism to achieve non-repudiation, something like digital signature for every single message you are sending. The fifth property we need is called no replay attack. Let's say you are doing some ATM transfer to your friend, 500 rupees, you are transferring through to the APM. Your friend is an evil guy. He capture all the packet during the transfer, and then after when you are not there, later replay those packet in the ATM network to get another 500 from your account. That is called replay attack. Nowadays, all application has a mechanism to protect it from replay attack. So TLS provide all these property except non-repudiation. Okay, non-repudiation it won't provide. You have to use some third-party mechanism at application layer. The history of a TSL uh, SSL goes briefly. It was developed by the Netscape Navigator browser engineer back in the days of the war between Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer and Microsoft. Okay. At that time, they wanted to enter into the so-called dot-com related uh, business. I mean, those people who are doing business online, they wanted to provide a secure way of transmitting the credit card information. So they invented SSL version 1, which never saw the day of the light because it was very, very buggy. So they later released version 2, which came with Netscape Navigator 1.1, but the design was very poor. Literally, nobody has focused on the cryptography on that version. So many cryptographers in the field, they just complained that you have to totally redesign the project. So they redesigned the project with version 3.0, which became super duper popular and everybody started using this. Then Microsoft got worried because Netscape is getting all the fame. So they came up with a counter protocol for the SSL uh, with a different name. I forgot the name right now. 
So later the Netscape decided, okay, since this is so good, the whole humanity can get benefit from this. Why don't I open source this and hand over to the central body called Internet Engineering Task Force to govern all the protocols on internet, okay? So they hand over the whole thing for standardization purpose. They make it open source. And uh, during this, uh, there's a big political war going on in the IET of discussion. That is, uh, Netscape want to use the name SSL, but Microsoft thought it's very one-sided because everyone knows SSL was invented by Netscape. So they don't want to give the, give the credit to Netscape. So Microsoft was to, wanted to use their own name. So they both, virtual parties, they don't agree each other. So they come up with a common name called TLS, which means Transport Layer Security. So as you can see here, the very purpose of SSL is to provide security to the transport layer, right? So that's why this name has changed from SSL 3.0 to TLS 1.0. So when standardized the whole V3, they took it and call it TLS 1.0 in the standard. It was published as RFC 2246. And later they invented 1.1, 1.2 to remove uh, some of the security weaknesses and also to introduce new features such as authenticated encryption support. But after that, it took almost 10 years to come up with the next version called TLS 1.3. So in these 10 years, the person who worked significantly to push for the standard is Google. Google and Cloudflare is another, co another company who did extensive testing of this draft version of TLS 1.3, directly implemented in, in Chrome browser and Google server and did the field testing with the real user traffic and gave the feedback to the IET of community, which later they converted the standard into a RFC. Now, as I said, this, this session is based on TLS 1.3, so I don't have time to explain the whole TLS in one slide. So if you really want to know the details of TLS, I have a YouTube channel, uh, uh, mkserv.wordpress.com slash SSL TLS, where I have 22 episodes in English as well as 22 episodes in Tamil, okay? So it's a very in-depth uh, analysis of TLS, like step by step, I will explain how the whole thing works. So if you want, you can first go to this place and read any errata is there because some video I made some mistakes. So before you watch any video on YouTube, you first read the description below to see whether I have made any mistakes or not. So I am going to just summarize the whole TLS in just a single slide. So at the very beginning, what it, what will happen is, oh, sorry. So at the very beginning, the client and server will agree, uh, exchange cryptographic parameters such as what cipher suite I'm going to use, what is the TLS version I'm going to use, etc. and agree upon the common parameters. After that, client will authenticate the server using the public key infrastructure called SSL certificate. For example, if you connect to Amazon, Amazon will send it Amazon certificate and then the client will verify whether the certificate is valid or not. Okay. If Amazon want to verify us, they can do a, what is called a mutual authentication by means of client authentication. But in reality, 99% of the time in the world, real world, people only do server authentication. They don't do client side authentication. Okay. But there are some private applications where people do mutual, like when they Company employees want to connect with the VPN of the company. They can do mutual art to confirm whether you are really my employee or not by installing a client certificate on your company laptop. Thereafter, the client and server will exchange the keys. They will generate an on-the-fly symmetric key to use for the rest of the connection to encrypt the application data. For this purpose, in the handshake, it used what is called a public key cryptography. Uh, in particular, it's using an asymmetric cryptography, meaning client and server has separate keys. One is called public key, another is called private key, okay? So the client will encrypt all data using the public uh, private key, and then the server uh, will uh, decode using the public key, or whatever public key. But this is only used for key exchange, not for the application data, because public key operation is a very, very expensive computationally. So this part, this part of this thing is used only for the, uh, the key exchange mechanism. Later for actually encrypting the bulk data, it only used the symmetric key cryptography, meaning both sides use exact same keys, okay? Thereafter, it will, one of the party after application data transfer is over, one of the party can signal to the other guy, oh, my job is done, I want to close the TCP uh, TLS connection by sending a encrypted alert called close notify alert. The standard doesn't dictate that both party has to send the uh, close notify. If one party send, it's good enough to close the connection. That is called unclean shutdown. If only one party send the close notification, it is called unclean shutdown. If both parties send, it is called clean shutdown. In reality, 99% of the web server actually do unclean shutdown, okay? So if you want more detail of how exactly TLS works, you can watch these 22 episodes in English and Tamil language. Okay, now the most important part of the TLS is the key exchange, uh, because that's how the whole application data is going to be encrypted using some one-time password kind of key, right? So that is achieved using a key exchange algorithm. They first exchange a key, 
there are three most commonly used algorithm in this space called RSA reverse summary adelman the guys who invented this algorithm and DHC diffie hellman ephemeral algorithm and nowadays the ECDH is the de facto standard elliptic curve DHC so if you are setting up your brand new server or if you are writing a brand new application which is going to make use of TLS please do not use RSA please do not use DHC you only use ECDH which is computationally more efficient and security wise also is more efficient than the other two okay even though in reality you will still see people using RSA for key exchange. In TLS 1.3, luckily you cannot use RSA at all because it has been banned for key exchange in 1.3. By default, 1.3 uses ECDHE algorithm. To authenticate the certificate, that is at the beginning when you connect to Amazon to buy something, Amazon will send it Amazon SSL certificate to the client. Client will go and verify the certificate. So for this verification purpose, it used the digital signature inside the certificate. To create this digital signature, it used what is called an authentication algorithm. The most popular being three author, four authentication algorithms are there. RSA, the only beautiful thing about RSA is it can be used both for key exchange as well as for authentication. All other algorithms, there is a separate algorithm for to do these two things. Only RSA is capable of doing both key exchange as well as authentication. That way it became super duper popular in the past. But going forward, you should not use RSA because the number of key bit size required to provide a sufficient security is becoming increasing day by day because of the advancement in the computing space and also the advancement in attack tactics used by the American National Security Agency. So going forward, if you're never possible, don't use RSA, you switch to ECDSA, Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Standard, which is computationally more efficient as well as provide more security than RSA, okay, for a given number of bits. DSA was you know, mostly used by the American military in the past. Uh, it's not very popular nowadays. It has been completely deprecated because of the computational, computationally it's very, very expensive and it's also very difficult to implement, okay. so. DSA is almost deprecated now. So you have only two practical choices, RSA or ECDSA. But given a choice, you ignore RSA, just use ECDSA whenever possible. There is also a new guy in the, in the flow called Ed DSA, Edwards Curve DSA. This is similar to ECDSA, the only difference being the elliptic curve used in its implementation is called Edwards Curve technology, okay? Later I was talking to Aravind that I am planning to give one more seminar on introduction to elliptic curve cryptography. If that happens in future, I will explain what is mean by here. Elliptic curve, what is meant by adverse curves, etc. at that time. Okay. So for the time being, I will just skip this. So to encrypt the application data, basically there are two different types of ciphers are used called stream cipher and block cipher. Stream cipher means you are encrypting one bit at a time. Block cipher means you are encrypting at least a small block at a time, like 128 bits at a time or 256 bits at a time. The most popular stream cipher is the RC4, which is being deprecated nowadays. RC4 is totally broken. So your application should never ever use RC4 because it's already broken algorithm, okay? Uh, to replace RC4, they invented a new algorithm called ChaCha20 Poly1305. So by default, for example, when you use Chrome browser with any of the Google server, by default, whenever possible, it will try to use the so-called ChaCha20 Poly1305. In some uh, use cases, the stream cipher is super fast compared to block ciphers, okay? So it depends on your use cases. So otherwise, most of the website nowadays use this block cipher called AES. In the past, people use data encryption standard called the DES standard, which doesn't provide any great security. It is uh, not advisable to use now, okay? It only provides 56 bit security, which is insufficient. Nowadays, any application worth its all did at least 128 bit security. So three does, the later they use three does, even though in theory it can have 128, but in reality, it only provides 112 bit security because the way how they implement this three does algorithm. But there are later new attack came, so the 112 bit also got reduced now to 108 bit security. So it is not good. So by default, you have no choice but to use only AES block cipher if you want, okay? Like I mentioned, RC4 is totally broken and deprecated. You should never ever use RC4 any longer. 3 does, even though it, it is good, but uh, the security you can achieve is only roughly 108 bits, so it's not worth. So you have to you have no choice but only to use either AES if you want a block cipher, which provide 128 or 256 bit security. Or you can use the relatively new Chacha 20 Poly 1305, which much more secure. Okay, it's an open source, open source design, much more secure. Entire design elements are available for all the public to read. It was designed by a famous cryptographer in US called Daniel J. Bernstein, who is a professor in cryptography department in one of the popular universities in US. In cryptography, especially when you deal with the TLS cipher suit, you will often we'll see often a term called Sorry, you will often see a term called mode of operation. So what is this mode of operation? 
let's say for example by default if you want to encrypt and send right let's say you have a long data you are sending a email but as i told when i use the block cipher the block cipher operate at 128 bit at a time or 256 bit at a time so you cannot take the whole email and encrypt right you have to divide your email into blocks of 128 bits like x1 x2 xn etc encrypt them you get your output y1 y2 yn etc if you directly send this output into the network that is prone to certain group of attacks okay because it can still maintain some kind of redundancy of what is available in the input data even though it's totally encrypted and junk some kind of pattern it can still remember so this method is called electronic cookbook mode which is called a textbook method which no one should ever use in that program by default if you just encrypt and send it is using this so called default easy put mode you should never ever use this mode in any of your programs okay because i will show you example what will happen if you use this so let's say i have a image here the image contains a text called cryptography and data security okay i am encrypting this whole image using aes256 bit so theoretically no one should be able to see the output right it's completely random junk after the encryption but in reality if you encrypt using the so called ecb mode and see see it as a image for example with a human eyes instead of the computer if you see with the human eyes you can still see some pattern in the encrypted data you can easily recognize this pattern is nothing but cryptography and data security right so that way the ecb is still preserving something from the input so so no one should ever use this ecb in any of the program you have to use a better mode of operation okay which provide much more uh, efficient uh, way to provide confidentiality and integrity to your data so one of the popular mode of operation used in the past is called cipher block chaining mode because the output of one block is sent as a input to the other block this way it's called a cipher block chaining mode but this has lot of weakness nowadays so you should not use this mode also the only available mode nowadays is so called gcm galua counter mode okay which we will talk about it a bit later so you only have two things nowadays available the one is called galua counter mode i used to pronounce this as galois counter mode i was told that this is wrong because this is a french word like when you write françois you typically say uh, let me go okay if you want to say the french name françois right in english you will write as francois or francois or something like that but it should be pronounced as françois similarly the word galois is pronounced as galua so everest galua the mathematician who invented the group theory in mathematics okay on his name they created this mode called galua counter mode so this is the default mode nowadays for example let me quickly show you let me go to the uh, for example i will just connect to the aadhar card website okay let me go to the aadhar card website uidai.government.in so press control shift i in your chrome browser it will show the developer tool developer tool go to the security tab you will see that it is using aes 128 gcm right so call galua counter mode so this is the cipher it is using to enter the uh, aes cipher it is using for the application data bulk bulk encoding and it's using 128 bit block size it's using galua counter mode for mode of operation okay the other one is called cbc mode which is no longer uh, advised to be used because of so many attacks on that in fact in tls 1.3 they totally removed the cbc cipher switch at all that mean you cannot use any of your existing 1.2 cipher switch with tls 1.3 it's not backward compatible so next the question is how to check data integrity typically when you download some iso file from the website if you want to check whether nobody has tampered my data no middleman in the middle has tampered my data typically the website provide the so called md5 checksum or sort 256 checksum right after download you use the same algorithm you calculate the checksum and make sure both the checksums are valid or not that's how we typically do data integrity check however in tls ssl tls we don't directly use the hashing algorithm because of several kinds of attacks with the default hashing algorithm so we use the hashing algorithm along with a key this special algorithm which uses a key with a hashing is called hmac algorithm okay so whenever i say hashing in the context of tls i always mean hmac even though it is not explicitly mentioned in the standards or cipher suite so if a cipher suite say sort 256 it means hmac sort 256 not the ordinary sort 256 okay in the past in tls 1.1 and 1.2 people were using md5 and sa1 hmac protocol which is deprecated md5 is already broken sa1 is already broken so you should never ever use md5 and sa1 in the context of tls okay you should use at the minimum sa256 if possible you can also use higher version depends on your requirement 
So now, how does the TLS connection look like? At a very high level, the client and server is there. Then TLS providing security to the transport layer TCP protocol. You first you have to first open your TCP connection. Then you do all the SSL TLS stuff. And then once you're done with the thing, you can close the TCP connection. This is a very high level overview. So internally, at the beginning, the client and server will send client hello, server hello messages where it can exchange the crypto parameter, what cipher suite it is supporting, what is the version of the TLS it is supporting. After that, the server will send the certificate message where the client will do server authentication, whether I am talking to the genuine Amazon.com server or not, or etc. And in some application, like in the company corporate environment, they can do mutual authentication, whether I am talking to the my own employee or not. Okay, that's called client authentication. It's, it's optional, but in reality, 90% of the time, you will only see server authentication. Thereafter, the handshake proceeds further called a key exchange phase where both client and server will exchange a key. If, uh, the exact thing they exchange depends on the algorithm they use, whether it is RSE algorithm, DHC or ECDHC. I won't go into the detail. You can watch my YouTube video if you want find details of how key is exchanged. Okay. Then after that, the whole handshake is completed. It will do the verif verification of the handshake integrity by sending a so-called finish message, which is nothing but hash of the entire handshake they have done from each of the part. Okay. Client will send a client finish message. Server will send a client finish message. Uh, server finish message. Thereafter, application data transfer start. At the end of the application data, one of the party can send an encrypted alert call close notify to the other party to signal that I want to end the SSL connection. In the standard, there is no requirement that the both party must send the close notify. Either party send is sufficient. So in this way, if only one party send the close notify, it's called unclean shutdown. Most of the server is nowadays configured to do your unclean shutdown. And if you want both sides to enter, it's called clean shutdown. Okay, so most browser it is fine to work with unclean shutdown. So one thing important you will need when you work with TLS is this tool called Wireshark. I think those who are familiar with networking, everybody know what Wireshark means. Wireshark is a tool to do packet capture on the network. In traditional Unix mechanism, you will use the so-called TCP dump command line to do the packet capture. But nowadays you need a graphical user interface to analyze the packet capture. So Wireshark is very very convenient to analyze. But if you want command line access, you can. It also comes with something called T Shark. So when you use Wireshark, it also installs a command line tool called T Shark. It is available for Windows, Mac, as well as Linux operating system. So here I'm I'm showing a T Shark analysis of a packet capture that I did in my lab. So minus capital Y minus uppercase Y SSL is used for display filter. Okay. Uh, you can only filter the SSL packet in this packet capture. You don't want to see any other packet. So here the client dot one is sending to dot hundred a client hello. The, the so-called TLS handshake message. Server replying with the server hello, followed by it sending its certificate. Then the server says yes, my side of the handshake is done. So it's called server hello done message. Then the client is doing client key exchange mechanism to exchange a parameter from the client side. Then the client says, yeah, my side is also coming to an end now. So very next message onward, I am going to send an encrypted message. So that there's a special protocol called chain cipher spec protocol to signal that it's a sub protocol inside TLS. So it sends a special chain cipher spec message to signal to the other side from the very next message on what is an encrypted message. So you need to first decode it before you read the message. Okay. Then the server say yes, my side of the connection is also ending. So from the very next message on what I will also encrypt. So by it says the chain cipher spec message, then it starts sending the encrypted handshake, which is nothing but the server side finished message. I told you right finish message is very important to verify the integrity of the handshake. So this is the last message in the handshake. Thereafter, application encrypted application data start. And finally, one side is sending to the other side encrypted alert, which is nothing but a close notify message to end the SSL connection. So this is a very high level overview using the TSR command. At SSL layer, you have basically two layers. Now at the top layer, you have so-called sub protocol. Handshake is handled by the handshake sub protocol. Chain cipher spec the protocol is used to signal the other side from the next message onward. I am going to encrypt my message. Then, if some error happens, they have a special protocol called alert mechanism to alert the either parties what exact error has happened, whether something gone wrong with the encryption or something gone wrong with MAC calculation, etc. Finally, application protocol to transfer the application data. So at SSL, it have two layers. The top layer is called record layer. Thereafter, it directly has the so-called TCP data in an encrypted format. Okay. The record layer is used to convey some uh, header mechanism to TLS. Now we will jump into the changes in TLS version 
So I am going to only highlight the major changes. Even though the version number is still only modified from 1.2, the minor version number is increased. In my opinion, it should be actually called as 2.0 because there are so much changes in 1.3. I started feeling like it's a new protocol itself. So many things has been removed. So many new things has been introduced. First of all, the version number. When Netscape Navigator guys in, invented SSL, they used the uh, prefix 0300 to mean SSL version 3.0. Thereafter, when it became standard TLS, they wanted to continue the same uh, notation and they just simply use 0301 to mean TLS 1.0, 0302 mean TLS 1.2 and vice versa. And currently 1.3 is called 0304, okay? Actually, I can show this version in the packet in a short while. So let me go to my... So this is a TLS 1.3 capture. So at the very beginning, you have a client hello and the server replies with the server hello. So if you go to the client hello, where exactly the client is conveying to the other party that I am supporting TLS 1.3, okay? That is conveyed in a TLS extension. Like I mentioned, the basic TLS only implement the very basic core protocol. All other features are implemented in the form of TLS extension mechanism. So once such extension is called supported version extension, okay? It's called supported version extension. Supported version, let's see where it is. Yeah, it's here. Like supported version extension. So you can see here the client is supporting TLS 1.2 at the minimum. That means the client do not support 1.0. The client do not support 1.1. At the minimum, it only support 1.2 and it also support 1.3. Okay. However, even though it says it support these two, if you notice at record layer, it is still using 1.0 at the record layer, right? This is the record layer. So the record layer alone, it's still using 1.0 formatting style to send this initial client hello. Because at this point in time, the client doesn't know whether the server support 1.1 or 1.2 or 1.3. So it don't want to assume anything. So it's using the lowest possible means for the record layer, okay, 1.0. And this mechanism was introduced to make the middle boxes happy. In internet, from the client to server, there are so many middle boxes like Cisco routers and other Palo Alto router, firewall, etc. They are all used, to, some of the thing will intercept and proxy the connection. Some will even do the so-called man in the middle attack like SSL proxies, etc. So they all uh, terminate. Sometimes they even terminate the SSL connection and recreate connection on the server side. So some of them, when you suddenly use a new protocol like TLS 1.3, they go cranky. They don't know what to do with this if it is not implemented properly. So in fact, when they Google tested 1.3, they found a lot of misbehaving middle boxes. Just to make them happy, they decided that even though I wanted to use 1.3 at record layer, I will still use 1.0, okay? Just to tell until I know for sure the other guy support the other version, okay? So let's see what happened. The server now has selected 1.3. So if you go here, the server has selected 1.3 to use, but still it is using a lower version in the server hello record layer. Record layer, it is still using the 1.2, meaning the server knows the client supports minimum 1.2. The client does not support 1.0. The client does not support 1.1 from the client hello message. That's why by default it will send us 1.0. But since it know already the client do not support 1.0, it use the next available smallest version possible called 1.2. Because this 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, all the middle boxes can understand. So it can freely pass the traffic on the network. Because initially they try to use 1.3 here, they notice many of the Cisco middle boxes and other middle boxes start failing the connection. They cannot go and change millions of middle box devices on the go when they introduce a new standard. So they want to cooperate with the existing devices on the network. So instead of asking all the devices to upgrade, they decided, okay, let's make the protocol a little bit ugly and just use the one lowest version in the record layer so that the traffic can happily pass through the network. So this is the compromise that was made to make the middle boxes happy. So thereafter, you can start seeing the application data. Right now, I have used the key to decode the application data. Otherwise, the whole thing will look encrypted. Okay, let me remove that key. So you can go to preferences. You can go to protocol in Wireshark. You go to TLS in the protocol. I have put a key here. That's why it's able to decrypt the data. I remove the key. So if you capture for a press, press packet packet, this is what you will see. Except client hello, server hello, everything else is encrypted. Unlike in TLS 1.2, the handshake, like certificates and all, is still part of the handshake. The handshakes are plain text in TLS 1.2 and before. Whereas even the handshakes are encrypted except the very first two client and server hello, okay? So that's an important change in 1.3. Even the handshakes are encrypted. That means even to see what is going on in the network. 
before you see the application data, you need to first decrypt the packet to see what is the handshake. For example, if you want to take a look at the certificate sent by the server, you need to first decrypt this handshake. OK. Then you see that both parties are start sending the application data. So at record layer, you will still see a different number. The exact version is only announced inside the supported underscore version. What are the different mechanism it is supporting? OK, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, etc. The important change in TLS 1.3 is in TLS 1.2, it used two round trip time before the application can start sending the application data. For the handshake client hello server hello and a bunch of messages, you need one round trip time. Then to do the client key exchange and server key exchange, you need another round trip time. Okay, so assume from Chennai to uh, US, if it takes 300 milliseconds for a round trip time, you are unnecessarily wasting too much of round trip time just to do the handshake, right? So Google want to really avoid this round trip time, and Google is the one who suggested to reduce the one round trip time. Okay, it is now reduced to only one round trip time in TLS 1.3. So in TLS 1.3, in the very first client hello, after the very first client hello server hello exchanges. Uh, then the very next message onwards, you can start sending the application data. That means no more client key exchange, no more server key exchange. Both the messages are removed now. Directly, the client hello itself will convey the key share of the client key exchange. Directly, the server hello will con itself will convey the key share for the server key exchange directly in the, that message as a TLS extension mechanism. So we can get rid of two messages called client key exchange and server key exchange messages. And there is also a mechanism called advanced mechanism called zero round trip time, meaning in the very client hello itself, you can start sending the application data. OK, but however, I do not recommend this zero round trip time because zero round trip time is pro. This is the zero round trip time. Very client hello itself, you can start sending the application data. Now you might have a basic question. I am now only I'm going to do the handshake client hello. How the hell I know the key use that need to be used for the connection, right? I have not even done my handshake. This is my very first message to the server. How do I have the key then, right? That's the basic question you have to ask. The answer is the zero RTT can only be used if you have already connected to the server in the past at least once. Let's say today morning you came to the office, you check your Gmail. Later after one hour, you are again checking the Gmail. At that time, even though you are opening a brand new connection, you can use the key which you got from a previous connection, okay? So when you make the very first connection, if you are supporting the so-called zero RTT, the client hello will send you an extension called early data extension server if it also support it will reply with a early data extension at that time the server will create a so-called pre-shared key psk pre-shared key and give it to the client the meaning is later if you come back to me you don't have to do your brand new connection you can use this key and directly start sending the application data that is the meaning of pre-shared key in this context okay so in zero rtt it's actually using a pre-shared key which it got from your previous connection with the exact same server so that is the next connection. You can directly start sending the application data in the very client hello itself. I do not recommend to use this feature because of the it's prone to replay attack. Replay attack meaning let's say the client hello you are sending the HTTP get to transfer money of five thousand dollar to your friend. Okay, the evil guy captures this packet. Later when you are not around, he can replay the packet, inject the packet again in the network, and get another five thousand dollar transfer to his account. Right. So zero RTT is prone to replay attack. So it has to be used only in a very controlled environment where you have 100% trust with your system, OK? For example, the early data mechanism is totally API's responsibility. By default, it's, it's going to be one RTT mechanism, OK? If you really want to use this, you have to manually configure the client and server to make use of this early data. So why I said this is not safe? Because, for example, in theory, the so-called HTTP get is called an item put in operation. Item put in means operation can be performed multiple times without changing the result, OK? How many times you do this operation, the result should not be changed. For example, in reality, it is not the case. In reality, for example, I can write get request like this slash transfer dot PHP question mark two equal to seven and amount equal to five thousand rupees. If I execute this command again, it will again transfer five thousand rupees, right? So it should not happen. So in reality, people are using this way. So even though in theory it's supposed to be item potent, in reality we found many of the time the commands are not item potent. So if you know your command is 100% ident potent, then you can use the so-called zero RTT. Otherwise, you should not use zero RTT, okay? Now, the key derivation. Those who are familiar with TLS 1.2, you know that at the very beginning of the handshake, 
both the parties will exchange a key, right? It's a so-called one-time password kind of key, like whether you can use RSA mechanism or you can use elliptic curve, diffie-hellman ephemeral algorithm, where you are using a key. That key is called a master secret, okay? The key both the parties arrive at is called a master secret. In reality, we do not use this master secret directly to encrypt the application data because the TLS protocol has so many sub protocol, it needs a lot of different keys. For example, it, the client side needs a key for the a MAC algorithm calculation, the server side needs a key for a MAC algorithm calculation, the client side needs a key for application data transfer, the client server side needs a key for application data encryption, the client side needs an initialization vector for some of the mode of operation, the server side needs an initialization vector for some of the mode of operation. So it needs at least six different keys. So given a single master secret, Internally, it used a cryptographic primitive called pseudo random function, and the single key will become six different keys now. Okay, that's how it generates multiple key using a single different key. So in 1.2, it used the so called pseudo random function. Okay, whereas in TLS 1.3, Whereas in TLS 1.3, this instead of pseudo random function, now it's using the so-called HKDF function. The HMAC based extract and expand key derivation function, which is much more secure and provide much better cryptographic properties. Okay. So it has been replaced with a HKDF function now. So HKDF is uh, standardized in RFC 5869. It is also used in many other places. The key derivation function is also used in many other places like Wi-Fi protocol, for example. In Wi-Fi, you typically set a password on your router, right? Internally, the password is converted into a cryptographic key using a key derivation function mechanism, okay? The same uh, technology now TLS 1.3 is using, called used by using the HKDF mechanism to using a single master secret, it can generate multiple secrets needed for the basic TLS operation. The major change in 1.3 is all the previous version cipher suite is no longer supported. It's not backward compatible with 1.2, 1.1, 1.0. You cannot any of the previous cipher with TLS 1.3, okay? So the only supported cipher is so-called AEAD cipher, meaning the mode of operation which provides both encryption as well as associated data. That means you are restricted to use only the so-called GCM mode of operation, okay? GCM and CCM mode of operation. All other non AEAD like C, CBC, ECB, they are all removed from the standard now. Okay. It only support AES GCM, AES CCM. CCM stands for counter with CBC MAC mode, SACHA 20 poly 1305 cipher. And another important change is the cipher suite format itself has changed now. In older TLS 1.2, the format is so clear. For example, you can tell what key exchange algorithm you are using. You can tell what authentication algorithm you are using. You can tell what is the bulk encryption algorithm you are using. The strength of the bulk encryption, 128 bit block size and mode of operation, Galois counter mode of operation. The last part represents the so-called HMAC algorithm or the pseudo random function you are using to derive the keys from master secret, okay? The SAR256, even though it simply says SAR256, internally it's using the HMAC SAR256 not the ordinary SAR256, okay? But in TLS 1.3, the total name is changed. See, there is no more convey of key exchange algorithm. There is no more convey of authentication algorithm. Directly, it will tell what bulk transfer it is using, bulk transfer algorithm, AES-128 GCM mode. That means they already removed R RSA. Now it's mandatory to use ECDHC, okay? So by default, if nothing is that, that is by default, it's using ECDHC. That's why there is no need to tell what key exchange algorithm I am doing, okay? So only TLS 1.3 support these five different ciphers, okay? All others are totally removed. In 1.2, it support almost 120 plus ciphers. All of them are removed now. So if you see the packet capture, if the moment you see the cipher, 100% confirm it is a TLS 1.3 connection, okay? Because you can see here, it doesn't convey the key exchange. It doesn't convey what authentication algorithm it is using. Right away, it used this format. So that means it has chosen one of the supported TLS 1.3 cipher. Guaranteed it's a TLS 1.3 connection. So as I mentioned, 1.3 is not directly compatible with previous version. The server hello den, is, uh, they thought it's a useless message. So they removed this message. Even though they removed this message, what Google has found out is, when they did a trial testing of the draft standard on the internet using the Chrome browser and Google server, many of the middle boxes like Cisco routers and other company middle box devices, they go cranky if you suddenly remove this message, they don't know because many of the TLS 1.2 implementers are buggy. They are not confirming 100% to the RFC. 
because of their buggy implementation, they were expecting ever hello done to be present in the TLS handshake. So they keep on waiting for it and TLS 1.3 doesn't send this, so it, it somehow it starts malfunctioning. So since they cannot go and upgrade all the millions of devices on the network, the standardization body decided, okay, even if somebody sent, you can silently take it and just ignore it, okay? So even though it is removed in reality, even, even today I still see the server hello done in a TLS 1.3 connection. For example, this is a TLS 1.3 connection, as you can see, it is still serving. Okay, this connection is very pure. I will show you a different connection. I will show you a older connection. Here you can still see the so-called server hello done. Somewhere you can see the server hello done. But this packet capture doesn't have. I think it's in some other packet capture. I don't have it here. So basically what I'm trying to say is even though the standards here to remove this, you can still see this message, okay? Just to make the middle boxes happy. In that case, the receiver or sender simply will ignore this message and keep proceeding further. Same cipher spec, they again thought it's a useless message. They removed this nowadays, okay? Even though it is removed in the standard, you can still see the change cipher spec because the middle box go cranky if you suddenly remove this. So to make the middle boxes happy, they adjusted the standard to cooperate with the middle boxes and you can still see the change cipher spec. Even though the standard say you can remove it, okay? Maybe it will take another 10 years or so to completely adhere to the strict adhere to the TLS 1.3 RFC. Now there is no more client key, key exchange message, no more server key exchange message, thereby they brought down to one RTT. Instead of two RTT, they now brought down to one RTT. The reason is these two now is directly implement used in a TLS extension called key share. Okay, as I mentioned here, we go in the client key, client hello message, you will see something called key share mechanism, right? Key share extension. Now, this is the key share extension. Here it says, I'm going to use the elliptic curve called curve 25519, also called X25519. And it is sharing it part of the public key of which is needed for key calculation, okay? Similarly, the server hello, you can see it is using the key share, key share extension. It is also agreeing to use the curve 25519 and it is sending the it share of the public key, okay? Which is needed for ECDHC key calculation. So this is key share from the client hello. This is key share from the server hello. Now, sometime what will happen is, even though this fellow say, okay, use the curve two double five one five one nine. What if the server doesn't support the curve at all? Then the server will send a special message called hello retry request, meaning. I do not agree with any of the parameters you are sending because I don't support them. Here is what I am supporting, okay, key share. So you please resend your hello request to adhere to these new demands I have. Then the fellow can send a client hello if he also support this particular mechanism and then the, the thing can continue. This is a brand new message introduced in TLS 1.3. If you are coming from 1.1, 1.2 background, this message is not even present in them, okay? This is a brand new message introduced in TLS 1.3 for this rejection of key share from the client log. Unlike 1.2, in 1.3, even the handshakes are encrypted except the client hello and server hello. As you can see here, only client hello server hello is not encrypted. This is because I'm, yeah. Uh, for example, here you can see this is the server hello, right? After the server hello, you can see change cipher spec. Then this is the it is application, it's not it's actually not application data. Okay. This is actually encrypted handshake message. It is sending the server is sending the server certificate in this message. If you decode this packet, you will know that this is not an encrypted application data, but actually the server certificate. So that means even to debug during the troubleshooting, you need to have the key to debug it. So that's another big headache for support engineers. Okay. So as you can see, all the yellow things that I have highlighted is already encrypted. Without the key, you are unable to decode this packet capture and see what is going on. So security improvements in TLS 1.3 means there is a less attack. It's prone to less attack. For example, they removed RC4 3 dash, which is a very weak algorithm. They removed MD5 SA1, which is already broken algorithm. They removed CBC because this is not a good, uh, strong mode of cipher. They removed RSA public key cryptography standard one version 1.5 way of encapsulating the data, which is prone to several padding Oracle attack like Blyson Bucker attack, robot attack, etc. 
compression is the root cause of several attacks in SSL, so the remote compression. Renegotiation feature is a root cause of several attacks in TLS, so the remote renegotiation. So with so many feature remote, now the SSL 1.3, TLS 1.3 is much more secure than previous version. Uh, for example, there was a group of attack called Sweet 32 attack, which was basically targeting the 3 dash algorithm. Now that they remove 3 dash, you are not prone to Sweet 32 attack. The, there's a attack called slot 2016 attack, which is targeting MD5 and SA1. Now you can no longer do such attack. There is a group of attack called Wadane attack, Bone Bromley attack, Beast attack, Lucky 13, Poodle, Lucky Microsecond attack, all of them targeting the CBC block mode of operation. Now you can no longer do this attack. Uh, the popular robot attack in 2017, as well as the group of Oracle pad, padding Oracle attack using this Blyton backer algorithm, they were all targeting the so-called public key cryptography standard 1 version 1.5 way of encapsulating the data. Since this has been removed, now you cannot perform any of this attack anymore. Crime 2020 was making use of the compression feature in TLS. So since compression is removed, you cannot perform any kind of crime-based attack. Mastery attack, renegotiation, DOS attack, triple handshake attacks were all targeting the TLS renegotiation feature. By removing this feature, now you cannot use any of this attack. Instead of renegotiation, now it is done with a lightweight key update mechanism. So from support point of view, if you want to decode the data, right? In the past, engineers were using the open source tool called SSL dump to decode, but there is a limitation with SSL dump. Even with 1.2, there is a limitation with SSL dump because it can only support RSA key exchange, okay? It cannot uh, decrypt the DHC or ECDHC. That is because of the, by nature of the, how the DHC and ECDHC work. DSC and ECDHC is called end-to-end -end encryption, meaning it would it provide a it, it provides a feature called perfect forward secrecy. Okay, it provides a feature called perfect forward secrecy (PFS). Okay, because if you see DSC as well as the ECDHC, the last E here, the last E here represent the ephemeral, represent ephemeral. Ephemeral means one-time use. Okay, ephemeral means one-time use, meaning. On the fly, it will generate the key, use it for the current connection, then destroy the key. Next connection will use a brand new key, okay? This way, it provides a feature in TLS called perfect forward secrecy. So SSL dump cannot, uh, SSL dump is not uh, able to find out the what is the master key used when you use these two algorithms, okay? That means TLS 1.3, I already told you TLS 1.3, the only thing you can use is ECDHC. That means you cannot use SSL dump anymore. Instead, what you can do is you can use the environment variable called SSL key lock file. Uh, for example, from your uh, Linux or Unix or even in your SIGWIN environment, you can say export. You can say export whatever SSL key lock file. You can give some file name, okay? You can give some file name, uh, whatever file name, SSL key lock or whatever file name dot text, whatever text. Where after that, if you start your browser and start browsing some website, whatever master secret it is using, it will write directly into this file, okay? You can even the curl support this. I don't have time to demo this because I am already running out of time. So maybe uh, so I will just show you an example how this looks like. Okay, because I don't have time to show you a demo. So for example, in older SSL 1.2, the session lock will look like this. For example, it will look like client random, and then you will see the uh, whatever the session ID followed by the so-called master secret. This is the so-called master secret. Okay. So the Wireshark or T-Shark tool need this master secret in order to decode the packet capture. Okay. Uh, in older thing, it's called a pre-master secret file, okay? Because this is the pre-master secret, so the thing works like this. At the end of the key exchange, at the end of the key exchange, both the parties have a key. This key is called pre-master secret key, pre-master secret key. From this, the older uh, TLS will use a pseudo random function, giving the PMS as the input, and then it will derive a brand new key called a master key, okay? It will again use a pseudo random function, use the master secret as the input, and will generate a bunch of keys, which is actually used for encrypting the application data and to provide the integrity mechanism, the key for the integrity mechanism. So this is called a pre-master secret. That's what you see in the master log is called a pre-master secret. By now, you don't have to do this. In the later 1.3, the thing will look like this. Basically, you need four different keys now. You need what is called a server handshake traffic secret, which is used to do handshake from the server side. Client handshake traffic secret, which is used to do a handshake from the client side. And you also have a client traffic secret underscore zero, which is used to encrypt the application data. There is a long story why this is called underscore zero. Today, I don't have time to discuss it. Maybe on some other day, we will have another session. So server traffic underscore zero, this is to encrypt the traffic from the server side, okay? So at the minimum, 
you need four different secret to decrypt a TLS 1.3 packet capture. Now you will see a fifth secret here. It will be surprising to see a fifth secret here, right? The reason is exporter underscore secret that the need for this particular exporter secret is, for example, sometimes your application needs its own secret. Your application need a secret to do something else. Maybe your application doing some kind of encryption internally. It needs some password for this mechanism. But as you all know, password it doesn't provide a good cryptographic property, right? Because it's a human generated. So the application need a cryptographically safe password kind of secret. So for that purpose, if application wanted data not from the user, but directly from the underlying TLS algorithm, they can make use of this so-called export a secret for their application purpose. Instead of a password, they can directly get this uh, secret from the current connection because they are all one-time use, right? So it automatically provides the so-called one-time password property as well and super secure than using a manually managed password. So 1.0, 1.1 disabled by default on Windows 11 and the next version coming in September 2023 onwards and all future Windows OS releases, they are going to disable 1.0 and 1.1. So by default, it will now support 1.2 and 1.3 the default is 1.2 okay and uh, if you are wondering when you're testing the application 1.0 1.3 if after you disable windows event lock will produce the event 36871 which means it has been now disabled by default for some compatible testing with a very old devices for some reason if you want to re-enable you can still do it by editing the certain registry key there is a solution article regarding this on the microsoft website you can google for it then my own recommendation is just always whenever possible use TLS 1.2 as the minimum version, okay? Also whenever possible use TLS 1.3 if it is supported by the other party. For example, we all know that Chrome by default supports 1.3. So if you try to connect to the Aadhaar card website, you will notice that by default it will directly go and connect to with the 1.3. This is the Aadhaar card website, Control Shift I to see the developer tool. The security it shows it is using TLS 1.3 here, right? TLS 1.3. And it is using curve 25519 to perform the elliptic curve key exchange mechanism. And for the bulk data, it is using AES algorithm with 128 bit block size and Galua counter mode, which is provide which is called a AEAD cipher, meaning it provides both confidentiality as well as integrity, this mode of operation. So this other card website is safe. Now for uh, I told you, instead of RSA for authentication algorithm, whenever possible, use the elliptic curve DSA because computationally that is much more efficient and key size also you need very small key size compared to RSA. For example, instead of using four kilobits of RSA key size, you can just use 128 bit of uh, elliptic curve keys. Okay. So when you choose the elliptic curve for your ECDSA or ECDSC, make sure you have you choose at least those curves which provide 128 bit security. For example, curve 25519 is the one of the most strongest curve we have. It's an open source curve. That means all parameters are openly discussed, okay? Unlike some of the NIST curve, for example, the curve like P256, P384 created by the American National Institute of Standards and Technology, which in turn is endorsed by the National Security Agency, the so-called biggest spy organization in America, okay? Because they have kept some parameters secret in this curve, some of the countries is not believing this curve. Maybe they thought NSA is able to decrypt this curve. So some uh, they, that's why the whole curve 25519 was invented, okay? Just as an open source alternative. Then the, we are going towards the post-quantum feature because of the couple of algorithm, post-quantum algorithm, which can break all the existing public key cryptography standard algorithm. It can break RSA, it can break EDAC, it can break ECDAC, the moment we have a quantum computer which is usable, okay? So uh, NIST is aware of this. So a few years back, they conducted a competition to come up with a uh, standardization uh, candidate for post-quantum algorithm. It was ended last year, and they finalized the following four algorithms. Crystal Kyber is a post-quantum algorithm for key establishment instead of ECDHC. Crystal Dilithium, Falcon, and Sphinx is for digital standard instead of the ECDSA, okay? So these algorithms are already available. And uh, most likely by early 2024, they will make it as a RFC. The standardization process already started. The NIST security level for post quantum cryptography competition requirement was five different security level. So the four algorithm which got selected, they already satisfy security level one, 128 bits of security, okay? All the four algorithms satisfy this property. And Chrome already started testing this algorithm in the upcoming version. They have a developer version. In the developed person, they are using the curve 25519 with the Kyber 768 for the key exchange. As I mentioned, 
the key exchange algorithm is called crystal kyber algorithm right crystal kyber algorithm chrome has already implemented in the chrome browser and they already started field testing without the knowledge of the user directly they enabled it okay if they want they can test with the millions of real real users so internally they are using testing this algorithm and providing the feedback to the rfc committee uh, where it is working where it is not working what are the headaches they are facing whether we can modify something else etc for example they found out it's not working properly with virtual jet scaler and some other uh, middle devices in between okay as i mentioned chrome has already started supporting this for, for in the development version uh, from starting from chrome 116 onward and they are also testing this over TCP transport protocol as well as the new quick protocol, which is used in the upcoming HTTP 3.0 standard. Okay, maybe some of you may not will be knowing about this. In HTTP, the most popular versions are HTTP 1.0 and 1.1. We all know that it is using TCP for transport layer, right? So in HTTP 1.0, in HTTP 2.0. Also, of course, we are using TCP in the upcoming version HTTP 3.0. They thought that there are so many limitations from TCP. So they change a brand new protocol called Quick Protocol for Transport Protocol. Okay. Quick by default is an encrypted protocol, unlike TCP. Okay. So they are using the so called Quick Protocol for TLS 3.0. So they are also testing the so called post quantum algorithm in the Quick Protocol as well. I think I will stop here. I still wanted to say a lot, but unfortunately, I ran out of time. So I will stop here for some questions. Thank you, Saron. And it was a wonderful session. And uh, although you were rushing, I think it gave a very good picture. What is TLS 1.3? How it differs from 1.2? What are the limitations? So I think it was a very well rounded uh, presentation. So yeah, now uh, let's hear from the audience. Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, uh, Saravanan, Arvind, I have a question. Can I? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Saravanan, two questions. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. It was very well present. Got a good idea of TLS 1.3 and the previous ones. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is fundamental. When you say uh, Chrome is supporting 1.3, TLS 1.3, at the same time you mentioned Windows 11 upcoming versions are not going to be supported. So what does it mean? I, I didn't catch. Or I don't know whether you said Windows or Microsoft is going to stop. So oh, Microsoft, it. Microsoft is going to stop supporting 1.0. They are going to disable 1.0 and 1.5 in the upcoming version of Windows 11 onwards. Meaning, oh, uh, if mm -hmm. you open any browser, Edge browser, Internet Explorer, or whatever browser you open, by default, it will start with 1.2. Oh, so even if the browser, okay, so the browser will also, if is is the support in the browser? It's the support is in the in the, the operating the support, system. support uh, comes from the underlying TLS library in the operating operating system. So the browsers are basically oh. calling the Windows API to make use of TLS libraries from the OS. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. So when so you they say are disabling pro, this, so if you really have some very old application, just temporary solution. If you want to give for a few months. I cannot overnight. I can change. I want to. I still want this button for a few months. You can re-enable it by modifying some registry setting. There is a solution article which is available on Microsoft website to do that. Got it. So, so when you say Chrome is supporting 1.3, uh, then is that 1.3 support limited to the browser only, or it also relies something on the OS uh, side uh, as well to support? Uh, I don't remember how it is like. Usually on Windows side, it by default uses the operating system TLS stack. Okay, okay, got so it. So if the it. OS is still limit, even the Chrome cannot do anything about it. I see. Okay, okay. And one more question, Saran, if you don't mind, very quickly. All this TLS is all generally unique, a peer to peer kind of uh, Correct. security. Right? Correct. Right? Yeah. So I know there is some ITF paper about, you know, like especially for web streaming and all that stuff, they want multicast. <laughs> like to leverage multicast and mm -hmm. TLS does not support multicast today. Yeah, because is, the very foundation that... of TLS, as I mentioned in the beginning, the very foundation is, is based on the so-called TCP protocol. All right. the streaming application needs UDP protocol. Right. So for UDP, we have a separate version of TLS called DTLS, Datagram Transport Layer Security. For example, in our company, I work for FI Network. Uh, all mm -hmm. the employees can work from home by connecting to the VPN 
the VPN servers are located worldwide in our company. This VPN sometimes the uh, workers are sitting in a remote region in a hilly region where the connectivity is not very good. There's a lot of de delay in the connection, lot of drop in the connection. So TCP performance is not good at all in such locations. Whereas mm. UDP, because of the datagram nature, it can still survive in those connections. So mm. they can use the so-called DTLS to form the VPN. So in our company, when we use VPN, by default, whenever possible, we try to connect with using the DTLS uh, for the uh, remote connection like this, like where TCP performance is not good. So for right. such application, you can consider using the DTLS. DTLS, okay, okay. But even multicast has a little bit of a, a like if you want to optimize a network ut utilization, like if you want to stream, you want to send one packet and then duplicate that packet to multiple devices, mm -hmm. right? Then um, uh, you are, uh, then there is no peer-to-peer -peer, uh, security, right? Because you're taking the same packet and then to some, to some point, it is the same packet. And then you reach the edge. At that point, you want to just duplicate it and send it to multiple homes. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I think there is a there is no end-to-end -end security between the source and the multiple homes. It's more like uh, it's a yeah, you are right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fragmentation there. So there is no TLS kind of protocol which supports uh, that today. I think I there know. is a brand new group of protocol people are proposing for those purposes. Uh, I, couldn't okay. immediately recall the name. So basically, okay. uh, for application like WhatsApp messages, signal protocol, where you are suddenly sending to a multicast kind of multiple users in a group, there's a special form of protocol they are developing uh, for efficient security to provide efficient security for them. So you will you will start seeing them in the upcoming years. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So sir. if you want That's to know good. what is the latest development happening in this area, there is a conference called Crypto Year Number, for example, Crypto 2023, Crypto 2022, etc., which is happening at the University of uh, 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 California in US every year, where all the inventors of the so-called uh, cryptographers, everyone meet there. So when I went a, few, a couple of years back, I was able to meet all the RSA, Don Trivers, Diffie, Hellman, everybody I was able to meet. So there you can go, <laughs> okay. where people can discuss all the upcoming protocols, what are the new attacks they invented, everything they can show a demo that like MD5 was broken in one chess conference, the SA1 was broken, a demo was shown in chess conference. Oh, very nice. Okay, thanks for that reference. I will also take a look. Thank you. Yeah, I have yeah. one question, sir. Uh, when we buy a digital certificate from the market, mm -hmm. uh, is there a precaution that we need to take so that we don't take uh, any previous version? How do we really ensure that we okay. buy the right uh -huh. digital certificate? The thing is, the digital the digital certificate has nothing to do with TLS version. Sorry, there is some echo in my voice. So the digital certificate itself has nothing to do with TLS version. Okay, so it is independent of TLS version. However, when you buy a digital certificate, I recommend all of you to use this website called SSLlabs.com. They have a SSL server test. Once you buy, you type the test URL, whatever your uh, development server test URL, click submit, it will generate a SSL certificate report. How good your configuration is. For example, you should strive for anybody work his salt should get your A plus. Anything less than A plus, I will not agree, okay? Anything less than A plus, I will not agree, even though they say A is okay. You should get a A plus result. Uh, F means straight away failure. For example, uh, let me show a quick demo of one, one test certificate, okay? I'm going to go ahead. So this already done, the test has been done. So it won't do a test from, it, the, it will cast the result for us to see. I'm going to see why it got a A plus. So this is the result. So this is retrieving the report from the catch. I think it's going to take some time, maybe. I think I have to refresh this page. It's showing the SDS page. I will show the current page. So let me just randomly go to one of the A plus report. It is retrieving from the cache. It all got A plus A plus result. So if you go to one such thing for the IPv4 testing, it shows A plus result. So you should get a minimum of A plus, okay? So why it got A plus? The server support TLS 1.3. It also support SNI, the so-called server name indication. And the kinds of algorithm it support, it will show in details, okay? Why it got A plus? It support TLS 1.3, 1.2 for backward compatibility. And then the cipher suite that is support in 1.3, cipher suite that is support for 1.2, it's also highlighting some of the weak cipher that you have to remove from your server configuration. 
and when you when the user end user use android it can simulate the android handshake okay android handshake uh, chrome handshake firefox handshake it can simulate and pro and tell you in advance what will happen if a user is using this particular version of the application so this is a good indicator how good is your server are so all of the ssl developer must i suggest you must use this service it's available for free so you can type your url of your test server i can submit it will take four or five minutes to generate this report for example, I will show you one, one T report, why it is called a T report, okay? So some of them, it got a, a very bad rating. So the reason for the bad rating, they will hi highlight. Whoever is the admin, he has to be fired from the job. He is using a certificate which is expired already, okay? 14 days ago, the certificate expired. He's not even renewed the certificate, okay? That's why he got a failure grade. So it's a very quick way to test what is the configuration of my SSL server at all. and. Uh, what are the different things that it support? Like what are the authentication algorithm it's using? Everything you can see in one go. Uh, if you detect any weak cipher, you have to make sure in your server, you have to better remove all those weak cipher support. And also it can simulate all the different browser, all the different uh, whatever phone kind of thing. Many, many of the standard thing it can simulate. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is in the Hello. Hello. Ah, sorry. Ah, uh, is some. Uh, are you still able to see my screen? I don't know whether something. Yeah, yeah. You can see oh, okay, your okay. screen. Okay, yeah. okay. Any further questions? Uh, this is. This, uh, Indrajit, go ahead. Is it Indrajit yes. speaking? Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, Bender, my point of view is that uh, you have shown to that uh, uh, if you are using the browser. In the browser, what are the other line item other than the security tab we can use uh, to debug the applications uh, related with the security? Any other? And other thing we have shown to the tools like uh, uh, bias. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, bias uh, salt tools. Any other tools we can use to di diagnose, diagnose this network issue? One of the most common tools that I use is the open SSL command line. You can just use the OpenSSL command line from your Unix or even if you are using the Windows subsystem for Linux, you can directly use to connect and to see, uh, you can turn on the minus minus V, the so-called verbose mode to see how the exchange is going on. And you can uh, troubleshoot if, for example, if something going wrong with the cipher suite or maybe the certificate, the common issue that we will find in a real life is the certificate uh, authority is not installed properly on the client machine. Like in many military applications, they may not be using a well-known CA. Inter military will have their own internal CAs. So the user has supposed to install all the internal CA at the appropriate store in the operating system for the CA certificate. If they have not done that, the connections are going to fail. So if you try to use the open SSL command line, open SSL dash dash connect or whatever, you can there's a tutorial on that, you can do that. And also if you are anything to do with SSL, I strongly, strongly recommend to read this book from cover to cover, okay? There is a book called Bulletproof SSL. I know this author in person. I strongly recommend all of you to buy this book and read from cover to cover. It's a mandatory if you are anything to do with SSL, okay? It's called Bulletproof SSL. This is a very, very well-written book. It's a second edition. You can buy the PDF copy directly from the Face Duck website, okay? Uh, they also have a hard copy if you want. And uh, this is the second edition. Make sure you buy the, the second edition. And this was written by an author called Ivan Ristik, the same guy who built the so-called SSL lab, okay? The SSL lab, that's how I saw. He has the guy behind this book. He uh, later sold this whole the SSL lab to somebody else. I think now somebody else bought this SSL lab. So he know in and out of SSL by heart. So he know everything what he's talking about. So before this book came, I learned before this book came, I learned it a very hard way. It's so difficult to learn SSL because there are so many components involved. Public cryptography, you need to understand the hashing algorithm. You need to understand bits and pieces. I learned from multiple sources. I got a headache. Then one fine day, this book came. It covers everything one needed to understand the SSL cryptography. Okay. So if you are in this field, I strongly recommend to read this book from cover to cover before you do anything with SSL. One nice thing about the book is, you can find my name inside the book. I keep giving the review for this book, okay? So the author added my name in the forward now. So every time the author released the test version of the book, I used to read and find some bugs in the book. I used to report him. So finally he put a thank you message in the book. 
So I'm not promoting this book because of that. I really enjoy the book. It has everything that you need to know about SSL TLS. Thanks. Okay, I have a basic question. Uh, see, we know that uh, TCP is an end-to-end -end protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you often refer to middle boxes. So Correct. the middle boxes interpret. Uh, that is the question. Okay, that's a good question. So I will come back to it. In fact, I'm working on a product in my company right now about your question. So what happens is, so normally all the users are assuming that when they use TLS, the things are going direct passing through multiple routers like this and then finally reaching the server right so nobody is able to decrypt the connection because the damn thing is encrypted this is our assumption that is our end user assumption okay but in reality what happens is nowadays there are so many malwares are in the network malware viruses and other things are in the network which are all using the encrypted mechanism okay the malwares are also encrypted now so the companies are very worried Bloody hell, I wanted to protect my application. Nowadays, malware also coming as an encrypted form and damaging my thing. So how do I stop this malware from entering my network? So what they do is nowadays, at the client side, after the firewall, they have the default firewall. After the firewall, or even before the firewall, just around the firewall, either before or after, depending on your security requirement. Okay? They have a device called SSL visibility device. They have a device called SSL visibility device. In fact, in FI, we have a product for this. We have a product for this called F SSL Orchestrator, okay? So what the so-called SSL visibility device will do is, whatever the client is sending, all the clients are configured to use the SSL visibility device as a default router, okay? Default gateway or router. So default gateway or router is the so-called SSL visibility device. It will intercept the connection. So the SSL V, this fellow will intercept all the user connection convert into to plane traffic. After converting into plane traffic, it will send the traffic to the third party security devices. For example, there are security devices called intrusion detection system. There are security devices called intrusion prevention system. There are security device from a company called FireEye, which most of my customers are using. The FireEye has a provision to detect malware, to detect antivirus, to detect lot of other issues. So you send the plane traffic to them, the device will scan. And then if nothing is, everything is okay, there is nothing to worry about, it will return the plane traffic after sanitizing, okay? You collect back the traffic, re-encrypt the traffic, send it outside to the server. That is what the so-called SSL visibility device is doing. In fact, at the time of speaking to you, my company is already intercepting all this data. For example, let me show you. I will go to straight away the website. Let me go to the website, www.fi.com, okay? So, this website, if I click the lock button, if you see the certificate of this website, it is already intercepted by my company. So if you click this, not only this, any website, for example, let me go to bbc.co.uk. So I'm clicking the clock button. Let me see the, sorry, I'm clicking the clock button. I'm going to the connection is secure. Certificate is valid. If you see, it's not showing the original issuer of the certificate. It instead is showing Windows event reporting CA, which is the intercepting CA installed on all the employees computer by my, by my company. So we are running a security tool on our device where we are intercepting this and we will look for any malware and other thing, whether the employee is copying all the source code of the company to Dropbox or somewhere else. We analyze all these things and then re-encrypt the data and then send out, okay? So for some of the application like banking application and health application, we bypass those sites because we don't want to see customer credit card numbers and banking details. So those sites, which we know for sure, we will bypass. So to do this bypass operation, we have a contract with a third party service. Uh, third party service will provide the so called endpoint security databases. Endpoint security databases, okay? That is, it will tell which websites are safe, which websites are not safe. You can devise a category. I want to bypass all the banking websites. I want to bypass all the health websites. Like that, you can selectively bypass. So, all these things you can achieve using the so called secure SSL visibility device. So, nowadays, most companies started using the so called SSL proxy server at their gateways. That means your traffic is no longer safe. It is intercepted by somebody in the network if you are coming from your corporate environment. Okay. Any Thanks. other questions? Thanks for that. Any other questions, guys? 